Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. And this is number 18, if you can believe it. And I promise it's not nearly as long as last week's. It's still not mini, but it's not as long. Don't forget that you can always click in the description below to jump to specific sections of the video if you're tired of the one section you're watching. And just for everyone's knowledge and pleasure, this one is all about Commodore stuff. So let's get right to it. All right, everyone, we have a package from Ed in Evans City, Pennsylvania. Hi to all my Pennsylvania viewers. That's here in the United States, of course. And this package came in on, hmm, when did I get this? Oh, I got this on the 19th of August. So it's almost a month since I, hope, since I received it. We have a note from Ed. Lots of packing material. Woo, woo. Okay, well, I could kind of see what this is. Whoa. There goes the box. Okay, well, this is at least a box for Commodore 64. Don't know if that's what's actually in here, but it might well be. Let's check out the note here from Ed. Hi, my name is Ed, and I've been a big fan of your channel for a while. I am donating my, my gently used Commodore 64 to you. I am the original owner, purchased in the early 80s, and I'm downsizing, and I would like it to go to a new home. I powered it up, and it booted fine, it has Music Composer cartridge installed. I am sure you have plenty of these. <laughs> yeah, I really do. So if you don't need it, maybe you could use it for your channel in some way. If you have any questions, you can email me. It has his email address. Thank you very much, Ed. So wow, Ed, cool. So a bread bin. Let's take a look at this thing. You already gave it away that it works, right? So, um, so there is a serial number sticker here. Oh, look at that. Hey, it is very gently used. So it's got the original material and right off the bat, this thing is not yellowed at all. In fact, I'm looking at a Commodore 64 over there, which I thought wasn't yellowed. This thing is like this kind of a grayish brown color. So here's the music composer cartridge. And we have here quite an interesting power brick. This is one I have never seen before. Now it is branded Commodore, but this almost feels like it's hollow. So this might be something that I can easily rebuild and make much safer. Oh, it's got screws. Well, I'll be, I have never seen such a thing. It has a three pin grounded plug. The DIN connection there has all the pins in it. And it says five volts DC, 7.5 VA and nine volts AC. Well, that is really cool. I have only ever seen 64 power bricks, which were the solid encased in epoxy type. Oh, look, it has included the original RF switch right here, computer and TV. And has a little 300 ohm to 75 ohm adapter on there, which was necessary if you had a, a modern TV. And then this is the cable that goes from the 64 itself into this. So I guess Ed, when he was using his 64, he was using it on a television set. I guess he didn't have the Commodore monitor with it. Although Ed, if you're watching this, uh, I'd be curious if you put a comment to say whether you were using a monitor or if you really had a TV. Okay, so in here, besides the foam, there is manuals and that is it. There is no bag. I have never seen a 64 that's this shade of a brown. It's, it's really more gray than anything else. I am shocked. Okay, so first off, it's a five pin video port. So this is one of the very early models. Now it doesn't have the silver or gold label, it's got the rainbow label on it, but this is in beautiful condition. Let's take a closer look at this thing on the bench. I still can't get over the condition of this Commodore 64. Just looking at the user guide, Ed clearly loved this computer and used it quite well. There's little snippets of magazine articles in here, although this is from 2002 it looks like. There are handwritten notes that were stuck in here that look like they are for the Music Composer software. And what's lucky is I recently was given a brand new user's guide and it's the same exact printing edition uh, of the one that came with this machine. So I'll be storing this one in the box with this machine. We also have the Music Composer instruction sheet or the little pamphlet that came with the cartridge here. 
On the flap of the box here is the serial number that should match the computer inside. We have 77,202. And there is the computer. Other than needing a little bit of a clean, this thing looks mint. I have never seen one this color before. I really don't know if this is like the original color from this machine. Oh, incidentally, there's a serial number 77,202, made in the USA. The subtleties of the case color of the Commodore 64 are really hard to convey on camera, but I'm gonna bring out my Ziff 64 here, which I thought had a case that was really not yellowed at all. It didn't look so bad, it was pretty shiny and everything but there is a substantial color difference between these two cases. This one is a lot more grayish brown color, and this definitely has a bigger yellow tint to it. So in Ed's letter, he had mentioned that this 64 worked when he tested it. Normally we would say never hook up an original power brick. We'll be opening this one up in a second since it has screws and it seems like this might be rebuildable. I'll be testing, of course, with my home built C64 power supply. I keep it tucked under here. This is always just sitting there ready to go since I always seem to have 64s on the bench. If you're pulling an old 64 out of storage or you're given an old one that hasn't been used in a long time, it's really advisable not to use the original power supply. It can potentially destroy the machine by sending higher than five volts into the five volt rail. I had mentioned earlier during the unboxing that this 64, while it has the rainbow logo, is actually one of the first generation machines. The very early ones were known as the silver label because they had a label that didn't have this rainbow. It just looked a little bit different, but they switched to this more modern format that stuck with the bread bins all the way to the very end of the bread bin line. But there are some telltale signs on these first machines on how to tell that these are the original first generation machines and none of the revised versions from later. A big telltale sign is when you just look at the side here, the writing that's on here for control port one, two and the on switch is white and on later ones, it's very dull, kind of a grayish color. So this sort of pops. In addition, the hole that goes around the power connector is square on this and see it says power there. The later ones, this is a round hole. There's some giveaways on the bottom as well. The label here for Commodore 64 is inside the little indentation on the plastic. Later versions, this was sort of stuck off to the side usually, and you didn't have these stickers here as well. I think this writing was integrated into this label, which is why it didn't fit any longer, and they usually just slapped it somewhere randomly on this area of the case. And finally, on the back of the machine, the video connector here only is a five pin DIN. The later ones had a higher number of pins, I think it was an eight. So if you just look at that connector and you count only five, you'll know immediately that this is one of the original machines. It lacks the capability of S-Video or Luma Chroma output. It only supports composite. There is something interesting I noticed about this 64. There are two versions of the Breadbin case design. One of them is higher than the other, like the, the entire height of the case is greater. This is the lower profile of the two designs. When you look at the back of the machines, there's a couple telltale signs about the low profile nature of it. The cutouts for these ports they actually go up into the top section. So notice there's a U here, but there's a little bit of a notch cut out in this top area. Another telltale sign about the low profileness is the cartridge connector here extends below the bottom of the curvature. So you see it has sort of this cut out notch right here, but on the taller cases, this is not there on the cartridge port. And I happen to have a very beat up example of one of the higher profile cases. So look at the cartridge port there. Notice it doesn't have that notch. And then notice that these two also don't go up into the top section. Although I see the RF connector does, these two do not. The overall difference in the height is not hugely dramatic. This is the high profile case versus the low profile case. And you notice that it's not a massive difference, but it is different. And if you try to take the foam pieces that were designed for this case, and you, put, you try to put a tall 64 in there, it will not fit. Now the very early Vic 20s were using this taller profile case so I'm intrigued that this is one of the earlier C64s, like that low serial number, and yet it's using the low profile case. Cause I just would have assumed that Commodore had moved to this low profile design in the later 64s, but I'm just not sure that that's the case. This tall 64 case is using one of the later labels. Notice, like I said, it doesn't even fit in there. And it's serial number is like, wow, it's, I mean, I don't know how the sequence works, but look, it's or 2 million, 167,054. So clearly this is a much later computer than this one. And yet this is using one of the tall cases. Okay, enough waffling on about the differences between the C64 cases. Let's test this thing out for ourselves. I'm gonna plug in my newer power supply. 
I'm going to take my 5-pin adapter. This is the one I originally made for the Commodore VIC-20 because it could use the same pinout as these early 64s. And here we go. Nothing else is plugged in. Let's see what happens. Look at that. We have a working 64. Now, it has relatively cruddy video quality, and that is indicative of these early, early VIC-2 chips that are here. In addition, Commodore used the wrong resistor value on the video output circuitry, which results in dimmer picture than you should have. Although this doesn't look too bad. There are vertical lines that just don't look great, but that could be the RetroTINK. This RetroTINK 2X Pro, whatever the latest one I have, doesn't seem to do a great job on composite video on a lot of these old computers. The older RetroTINK seem to work a little better than this one does, I have to say. Let me plug in Sven Peterson's diagnostic harness and I'll use the regular diagnostic cartridge here on this machine so we can get a better test just to see how well things are working. The harness is all connected. I don't have it open, so I haven't hooked up the keyboard loopback connector, so we'll get an open on that. But all the other tests uh, should work properly like this. The one thing I'm noticing is that the screen output over composite video is not too dim. Oh, control port bad. Interesting. So this is claiming that the 6581 is bad under control port, which would indicate that the paddle input, the analog input, is somehow not functional on the SID chip. I'm gonna wiggle the connections that are into the controller ports here, and also on the user port, just in case that was a loose connection that maybe was causing that issue. I am noticing that the video output does not seem too dim. All of the fine pin machines I've worked on before always had really dim composite video output, and that was because of that resistor value that was wrong fixable by just soldering a new resistor into the place of the old one on the, it was on a transistor kind of follower circuit. This seems to be okay. So maybe Commodore did not mess up on the later versions of this five pin board, only the earlier ones. Yeah, we're still getting the same bad and bad, but the SID, if you listen, The SID is working, there's a little bit of glitchiness happening in those tones, which may not manifest itself if we play a game. I thought it might be fun to plug in this Music Composer cartridge, see if this is still working. It's interesting how simplistic this cartridge is, like this is the main menu that pops up, it's just sort of a text mode. Let's hit play sample. That is pretty awesome. I hit four for edit and it takes us into, yeah, this editor here. G1, play song. That didn't do anything. <laughs> All right, load song. Oh, press play. So I'm wondering if this maybe came with a cassette tape with a bunch of sample songs you could load in. And of course you could add your own songs and then save them later back onto the tape. There are some sample songs in the manual and it's kind of cool actually. It's pretty descriptive on how you can use this. And it looks like you have quite a bit of functionality to edit this sound effects and the waveform that's coming out of the SID chip. So you really can take advantage of the synthesizer. You can even adjust all the filters on the SID. Ed, if you're watching this video and you used to use this thing to compose music, I'd love to hear about it in the comments section. Well, it goes without saying that I'm gonna open this up. So yep, here's my trash towel here. Let's flip this over and pull those screws out. Has this wonderful machine ever been opened up before? I didn't get a crack on the screw there, just sort of turned smoothly, but this is in such nice shape and the plastic is so shiny, it doesn't, it's not dull. I really feel that this was kept inside the house in a dry climate controlled place its entire life. It like wasn't stored in the attic or in a garage or a basement where it was damp and cold or really hot, because that seems to take a toll on these machines. This thing, yeah, was really taken care of. It's got no dust on it, except for a little bit here. Yeah, anyways, let's see. Will it have the old crack when I open it? Not even a crack, and not even an RF shield. Look at that. I just love it on these old machines. So the keyboard cable does not have that metal ferrite ring where they loop the cable through it. That was for RF emissions. And other than the shielding over the VIC-2, there's no shielding on the top of the machine. It does have a shield on the underside. I can see where it's soldered on. It's that gold color shield. 
I am really impressed, just like the outside of the machine, the inside of this machine is mint. It's so clean in here. As is perhaps totally normal though, the clasps here and here are snapped. This one is still intact, but these ones are missing. And I didn't notice any parts floating around in this machine. So perhaps someone has been inside here. Let's just turn this upside down and shake it. Yeah, nothing came out. So maybe those had fallen out a long time ago or this computer has been worked on a bunch of times. But here's the PLA, and this is either the 82S100 or the slightly later Philips version of that, which was a programmable chip. This is before Commodore was making their own uh, PLA type chips for the 64. But it's funny that it has 8411 on here. So was this replaced at some point after this machine was made? Clearly this computer is from 1982 based on other date codes. But this is not the first 1982 early 64 I've found that has one of these later PLAs in here with the sticker on it. Processor is the 15th week of 1982, so that is really early. But looking at some of the other chips, this one here is 31st week of 1982, and it is soldered into the board. The RAM is a split personality. We have four NEC chips that are from the 23rd week of 1982, and then we have uh, four Oki chips that are from the second week of 1983. These 6526s are probably the latest chips I can find in here. They are the 37th week of 1982, so that is later in the year. So, so I would wager this machine was put together in the sort of mid-late 1982. It's an awesome testament to the reliability of some of the earliest machines. It feels like to me that the 82 machines are more likely to work than the later ones. And I think a lot of that goes down to the fact that the PLA, which is either the Signetics 82S100 or the later Philips one, is a far more reliable chip than the MOS chip. So a lot of 64s are taken out of commission due to the PLA. And it seems like on this, on these ones with the original programmable chip, they're just a lot more reliable. So I think at this point, I'm not gonna do anything to this machine. I'm just gonna put it back together as is. And I'll put a note to remind me that the SID may have potentially a bad analog input. Remember when putting screws back into plastic, like on these standoffs, you should go backwards until you hear a click. There's a click and then just lightly tighten them in. You don't wanna create new threads. These are self tappers. So if you go backwards until it clicks, you know that the screw has fallen into the original threads that were created when this machine was first assembled at the factory. Thank you very much to Fran Blanche for turning me on to this technique to ensure that you're not gonna potentially add more stress and damage to delicate plastic stuff from the old days. No Commodore 64 video of mine is complete without an 8-bit dance party. So I'm gonna stick in the Easy Flash 3 and we're gonna boot up, you know what, Donkey Kong Arcade. All right, so there's the Easy Flash. Now we're gonna go to A, Club. oh, I forgot. The Easy Flash 3 doesn't work on these original machines. There is actually a fix for getting the Easy Flash working on these first revision motherboards. It involves adding a couple extra components to it. I'm gonna leave this machine totally stock, so I'm not gonna make that change. So sorry, no 8-bit dance party. This machine does deserve a little clean, so let's just give it just a small spritz. Barely needs any attention at all. I continue to be amazed by this 64. This computer was made in 1982. And I would be really hard pressed if I was just looking at this to without picking it up and touching it to know that this wasn't made yesterday. Like one of those new modern reproductions of a 64. 30 seconds of cleaning with a cloth and some Windex is all it took to make this thing look flawless. Let's take a quick look at the power supply, which I have never seen one of like this before. Not that I have that much experience because a lot of the 64s I get don't have the original power supply. But this is Commodore part number 902-503-02. It is 117 volts, five volts DC output, 7.5 VA, of course, nine volts AC and nine VA output. On the bottom, it's uh, USI slash billion, CSA, which is the Canadian Safety Authority. I think that's what it stands for. And UL is Underwriter Laboratories uh, listed. So these are two agencies that certify the safety of this power supply for use on our power systems here in North America made in Taiwan, and I think this is a day code, 47th week of 1982, so maybe that implies that this machine was assembled and then finally boxed and sold around the end of 1982, just in time for the Christmas season. Let's crack this open. I've never had one with screws, not in the US, that's for sure. You always have to smash them apart, basically, to try to get inside. Oh, nice kind of gold-colored screws. There we go. 
what's inside. Wow, look at that. Completely serviceable design. So here's the large mains transformers that takes the 115 volt mains here and converts this most likely into two outputs. One is nine volts AC nominal. That's for Dirk sending directly into the 64 to power up the circuit in there that needs that to generate the 12 volts and whatnot. And then the other part will be some AC voltage that's gonna be rectified, turned into DC and sent into a linear voltage regulator, which will be attached to this component here, which is then sent to the machine as five volts. On the five volt power supply, we have a 3052P, which is something like a 7805, but uh, and then you have a resistor, you have a small capacitor and then a large filtering cap. This will be to take the kind of sort of rectified AC and bring it into sort of a DC voltage that then this can regulate down to five volts. What's relatively exciting about this transformer is that this entire five volt module here takes up quite a good amount of space in here, but that is plenty of room to install a small switching five volt power supply into this cavity, and that would allow a nice upgrade on this power supply. And lastly, in the box with the 64 was the original RF switch, which uh, with a 375 ohm adapter on it, still has the tape on the back here, so it can be stuck right onto your TV to permanently leave some residue. There it is, TV slash computer. And then the original RF cable that was probably bundled with the computer. So thank you very much, Ed, for sending in this absolutely mint and beautiful C64. This is definitely the nicest one I have and will be going into my permanent collection. Okay, so the next set of stuff was donated to me locally by someone who uh, will remain nameless. I'm not gonna say their name, but if someone here in Portland who donated this stuff, so it's not in a box because uh, it was just handed over to me, but I have shown some of this on my Twitter feed already. So if you don't follow me already on Twitter, um, I'll put my hashtag, whatever Twitter name handle on the video here, also being down in the description. But I, I post occasional random stuff and you might see things on there before they actually become videos, like pictures of stuff that I've I've gotten or whatever that I might be working on. So it's, it's an interesting way to possibly see what I'm working on. Now, what was handed over to me was a single floppy drive here. So this is a Commodore disk drive. And what's really cool about this thing is it's just in mint condition. It has an original Toys R Us badge on the side. And if I open this up, inside is a very mint, but it's used, it's not brand new, 1541 disk drive, still in the original plastic. It doesn't have the power cord or the IEC cord. So, or, or the books or manuals for that matter, but that's okay. I just love the fact that this thing is so clean. Now, I've taken a look at this, uh, as I mentioned, it was already on my Twitter, but I have not tried it yet. And then I have a random assortment of books, which we'll take a closer look at, but we have the Commodore 64 user guide. We have an Epson printer user manual. We have something called the Dumpler GX, which I think is like a thing to print with. I don't actually have that device, but then we have a couple interesting books. Here we have the Computer User's Guide to Electronics by Art Margolis. Now I've reviewed a book by Art already that someone else sent in. It was the C64 Repair Manual. And this one just looks like a more general computer from the 80s manual or kind of a book on tech, you know, technology, how it works. Talks about RAM, there's like simple circuits showing gates and whatnot. And then we have an interesting book, How to Make Computer Controlled Robots. Now I'm gonna say that this is a UK book, even though on the back here it has an address of Tulsa, Oklahoma, because this Sony TV here, I think is a PAL only television set. And if you've seen any packaging or ads for the Dragon line of computers, that's the Welsh Coco clone line of computers, all of the pictures they have use this same Sony TV. Now, of course, if you are familiar with this TV being sold in North America, let me know. I've never seen it, but there's another giveaway. This book here is, it contains basic programs and it's for 60, the C64, VIC-20, the Spectrum and the BBC Micro. So that kind of gives it away that the basic programs are for those four computers. But it's a really, really cool book that literally tells you how to build stuff like robots, hook them up to your computer, like to the user port or the various ports on these machines, and then write basic programs like it actually has all the code to control the robots. And then we have a Sam's Commodore 1541 troubleshooting and repair guide, which is kind of interesting because uh, here's a 1541, maybe it's broken, right? Uh, you may notice that this uh, manual is sort of apart, and that's actually something that I did. 
And the reason why is because I don't think this particular Sam's Guide, which it's actually, you know, a relatively thick book here, is available on the internet. If you have seen a copy of this in PDF form, please let me know. But I pulled the binding apart with the idea that I was just gonna cut the binding off entirely. I don't have a cutter that could cut through this whole thing, but I can cut through like the smaller sections, like I've taken out the sections here. And then I will scan this whole thing in and put the PDF online if it's not available. So let's take a look at this stuff on the bench, see if this disk drive actually works. Talk about nondescript packaging from Commodore, just single floppy disk. And the white and the gray color scheme really makes you feel like this was the packaging that was for the VIC-20. Was the 1541 packaging always this boring or did it eventually get better? On the bottom here, it's just pure white. This side looks a lot like the other one, except they added 1541 here and made in Japan. And you really have to wonder why isn't 1541 written on this side of the box? And if I tilt it down on the top, it also just says single floppy disk. I think there'll be lots of people in the US who will remember these stickers from stuff bought at Toys R Us. Date sold, it says 620. Bit odd that they didn't even bother putting the year, but I guess it was more to do with if you were returning this, uh, you know, within the 30 days or 60 days or whatever the return period was, it says item cannot be removed without this ticket. So this was just the little thing they stuck on everything they sold so that they could track when you brought it back. So we need to find out, does this disk drive actually work? It's certainly in near mint condition, so I'm hoping it does work. Oh, oh, I opened this thing upside down. Actually, it's not so bad. Still get that out pretty easily. The drive was in the foam correctly because it has little indentation for where the feet go. There's also an indentation here for where the drive front goes, and then the like fuse holder and the back power switch stuff goes this way. So there's really only one orientation where this goes in properly. And there it is, only a very slight amount of dust Otherwise, a very mint looking 1541 disk drive. I figured since this thing looks so mint, it would be good to compare it to the Commodore 64 that Ed sent me to see if their colors basically match. Let me try to get these aligned perfectly here. And yep, I'd say this mint Reve 64 basically looks identical in color to the 1541 that was also mint. And believe me, both of these came from totally different people. It's just that both Ed and whoever owned this thing obviously kept them in climate controlled, nice, dry, not hot, not cold environments, and just it maintained their original appearance. I think that we all know that no matter what the cosmetic condition something is, that doesn't really mean it's gonna work or not work. Things that were cared for meticulously, stored away in perfect environments, the chips can still go bad in there. So let's turn this on without the computer hooked up and see if it operates normally. The power light should come on, and as should the red activity light, which should shut off after a couple seconds and the drive should stop spinning. That would be normal operation for a 1541 that was at least the processor was running, it was executing the code and the ROM, stuff like that. So here we go. Okay, well that's a good sign. That is the behavior that it should have. First thing I wanna do is put a cleaning floppy in this thing. Now I've, I always use this disc, but people were like, if you put a double-sided cleaning floppy into a single-sided drive, you're gonna cause a problem. So what I did is I cut out a piece of a bad floppy disc and it would be ideal if I could make it the right shape, but I just stick it over this thing here. So that way the little pad that's on the top of this drive is a single-sided drive. It doesn't just rub on this cleaning drive surface. So we'll just put some alcohol there and slide this disc into the disc drive. And on the diagnostic test here, I'm gonna hit H for head exerciser. And I'm just gonna say motor on, F5. So that's just spinning the disc around and I can just move the head around. So let's see, F4, F4. I don't really hear anything. So I don't really know if this thing is working. I didn't hear any head activity. So that could indicate that there is a fault on this. But I have a known good floppy disk here. This is formatted in good on another machine. Let's pop this in here and exit out of this. And back at the main menu, I hit P for performance test, which will run this drive through all of its paces. Hit enter to start. It begins with a format. That's exactly what you want to see. I feel very confident when a 1541 or one of the other Commodore disk drives passes all the tests with this diagnostic cartridge and you get that as the result, the drive is good. 
So that makes me really happy that this really mint condition disk drive not only looks perfect, I don't even need to clean it, but it works perfectly. So a huge thank you to my nameless benefactor who gave me this disk drive. That person has also given me numerous other amazing things, some of which have already been shown on the channels. Other things will be shown in the near future. So thank you very much. Okay, we have a package from Yuli in Deutschland. Hello to all my German viewers. You may be noticing this bright green tape on the bottom of the box. Sure enough, this package was actually inspected by US Customs and Border Protection. You, Yuli had written no shoes here. And then on the top of the box, he wrote caution retro inside. That may have scared some of the customs agents who would be inspecting packaging. So they felt that they wanted to look inside of here. What is sort of amusing to me is on the top here is a piece of paper that's the customs declaration. Usually it says contents on here. They didn't even open this. So they opened the package to look inside looking for who knows what, but they didn't even check to see that the contents that were declared matched what's in the box. Okay, let's check it out. Oh, look, greetings from Germany written here on this flap. And on the top one here, it says, keep up the great work. Okay, right off the top, I see a bunch of Harry Bows. There's some of the sour versions. There's regular gold bears. And there's a version here, which I am not familiar with. It says S-A-F-T, soft. Is that soft in, in German? I'm gonna have to use Google Translate to translate this orange bag, unless the flavors are just different. Oh yeah, I see it has banana as well, cherry. So it's got different flavors than the usual versions here. Let me move the box onto the floor and I'll just pull things out one by one. There are packing peanuts in here, so I don't wanna dump them all over the bench. Okay, so first thing, seems to be a joystick. And it is indeed, it's got the nine pin connector. On the bottom it says made in China, but it says it's the quick joy. Hiding in the box was another thing of Harry Bows. These are the ones that have the white stuff on it, which I don't love. I mean, it's kind of an acquired taste, but I'll still, I'll still eat them, of course. Okay, and here is something that feels a little bit like a computer. I am wondering if Customs opened this up. I don't think so necessarily, so we'll open that in a sec. I see another joystick and another joystick. And we have, looks like an IEC cable. So that's a serial cable for a Commodore. I think that's it in the box, unless uh, the Customs guys stole some of the stuff out of the package. I mean, what were they looking for? And when they opened the box and they're like, what is this crap? Like, who wants this stuff? And then they taped it back up and were like, send that on its way. They were looking for contraband or whatever, but didn't find it. Okay, what is in here? This is interesting. Some kind of a computer, it feels like, or something, I don't know. Always a surprise. You may be noticing red tape on here and think this is from customs, but it is definitely not because it looks like the writing is in German. Oh, I don't know. Do not something. No, I think it's in German. I don't think that came from the US customs. Okay, so let's see here. There's a disc on the bottom. Okay, so we have a tape here and it's a game that says Sue Townsend and the growing pains of Adrian Mole. Named after me. Attached to the bottom of the computer were some floppy disks. It says C64 Frankenstein. And then we have two 3M disks that aren't labeled. And we have a bread bin, bread bin 64. Gotta love the Commodore bread bins. And as usual on the bottom, the sticker says made in West Germany. Of course that makes sense because this computer's probably from like 83 or 84 when Germany was still set two separate countries. This one has the writing along the back here, memory expansion, stuff like that in English, of course, even though this was a German computer. And let's check that out. Some interesting joysticks here. Oh, I don't know if I recognize this one. And one more joystick here. Nice. Someone really was trigger happy. <laughs> this one on the bottom says QJI Turbo. And then this one has an LED, but no name. Before we take a look at this stuff on the bench, let me try out these different Harry Bows here. So the first ones are the ones that have that white stuff on it and it says Milk milk Baron or something. Does that mean that this has a milk flavor to it? I've, I've had the white stuff before, never found it particularly milky. Actually, it's funny, they smell a little bit milky, so it's a little colored bear, but then on the backside, it's like a whitish kind of rough texture. It's hard to explain if you haven't had these before. 
Yeah, it's kind of what I remember. I, I bought these before when I've been visiting Europe. You don't really find the white coated ones so often in the US. I mean, you do sometimes in the multi-packs, but this is like an entire package of just them. Let me try one more with the, the red looking, I guess a little bear. So the white stuff is a bit hard to describe. It's almost the consistency of a marshmallow, but it's not nearly as sweet as marshmallow, at least the stuff they sell in the US. So I just don't totally love it, but it's not bad. But this bag will be consumed, don't worry. It's just, it'll be the last one to go after all these other ones. All right, now I'm breaking into the regular gold bears. These are the ones that are easy to buy pretty much everywhere in the world, right? It has a Deutsche Bahn like train ticket. Looks like you have a 15 euro, I don't know, e-coupon inside, probably 15 euro off a ticket maybe. So as I had mentioned, I think on a previous video, what's interesting about the German manufactured gold bears is the colors are a lot less vibrant than the ones that you can buy here, which are made in Turkey or in England often, but I think they don't use the same artificial colors they do in the US or the ones destined for the US. These ones are just like fruit coloring. So like this red bear here is a much kind of duller color. I'm gonna to need to buy some of the US version to have a direct taste test comparison to these. Now that I have this in stock and I'm not gonna eat these all before I go to the supermarket here to buy some. Uh, the one thing I do know is there's one extra flavor or in the US version, we have one less flavor. And it's weird, the green colored ones in the US are like strawberry flavor. And here there's a strawberry and a raspberry. So there are two reddish colored ones that have two different flavors. And for whatever reason, they took out the green apple, which is the green ones in this version. And in the US, the green one is, yeah, it's like one of the, the berry flavors. It doesn't really make sense. All right, next up are the sour ones, which in German, it says sour, S-A-U-E-R, sour. I think if I go in my trash can upstairs, there is actually an eaten, like empty bag of the sour ones here that I had bought um, at my last visit to the supermarket. They're a little softer, at least the US ones are a little softer. And then of course they're coated in like a citric acid sort of sour coating to them, but they're also sweet, of course. Yes, those are delicious, just like I thought. If anything, they're actually, I wouldn't say they're more sour, but they're a bit less sweet. And actually these are probably a little bit less sweet as well. And since I had just eaten some of these recently, I think that the regular gold bears, these ones, the German or European variety, these are probably the same ones they sell everywhere in Europe. They're a little less soft. They're a little like more chewy. It's not like it's bad. It's just slightly different. And then finally, we have this last bag, which I'm saving for last. It's, it says soft, I think, S-A-F-T. Is that soft in German? So yeah, these ones are definitely more oily. Like there's some mineral oil or whatever that's used in the manufacture of gummy bears. So these have a little bit of a more shiny texture to them than the regular gold bears. Let me try this yellow one. I don't know if this is the banana, but I hope it is. I love banana. Yeah, that was the banana one, which was pretty good. I gotta say, I'm not sure I've ever had a banana gummy bear in my entire life. I like that combo. And this is an orange flavor one, which I assume is gonna be just regular orange, but absolutely the texture on these is softer than on the regular gold bears. I'd say it's even softer than the US version of the gold bears but closer to the way the US, US ones are. They're a little more oily, a little more sticky, and a little softer than, than those ones. So yeah, those are delicious. And if I had to rate all of these, I'd probably say that the regular original Gold Bears are at the top. And then I would probably say that these are neck and neck, like in second place. And then the ones with the white milky stuff, marshmallow, whatever, that's gonna be last place, like fourth place. <laughs> yeah, no, my, they're, they're my least favorite, but they're so good. There are a few varieties in the US that I really like that I'm not sure you can buy internationally, but there's twin snakes, which is like two gummy worms and they're attached to each other on each end. And one of them is sour and one of them is sweet. So you can kind of bite off little pieces of them and eat them and get little mixes of, of sweet and sour. And there are two different flavors. So as you go through the bag, there are a couple different flavor combinations. I think there are four different combinations. I like those. And I also like the little cola ones that are little, uh, they look like little cola bottles and they have a Coke flavor to them. Those are, those are super good too. Well, if everyone can believe it, I've been opening up packages here, doing more mail call packages and another viewer, but one from the US has gone ahead and sent me a bag of US Haribo. And these are the ones that are made in Turkey. So we can have a taste test comparison between the US ones and the German one. And I don't even have to go to the supermarket. Now, what I really don't understand is that if these are made in Turkey, so basically Europe, I don't know <laughs> which half of Turkey these are made in, the side that's on Asia or the side that's in Europe, 
But why is there a difference? Why don't they just make one version for the whole world, sell that one? Like, really, what's the difference? Now, last time I talked about Harry Bows, a lot of people jumped to the conclusion that the ones in the US were probably made with corn syrup. But these are made in Turkey. And pretty much if you go to the store and you look at the package, it says right on the back, made in Turkey. So I don't think that's the case. In fact, this is, the first ingredient on here is glucose syrup made from wheat or corn. So you can also create wheat syrup, which is like sugar out of wheat, right? So, you know, that's probably what's going on in here. And then looking at the German ingredients, I mean, I don't read German very well, but I think the first thing on here is glucose syrup as well, which I am assuming is the same thing as this. But I don't know, hopefully it comes out in the camera that you can just tell the color, especially the green ones. Look at the dramatic difference between the green ones on the German ones versus the ones from Turkey. Also, the red ones are dramatically different between the two as well. Okay, let's compare the two. On your left, I have a German one. And on your right, I have one of the Turkish American ones. And yeah, there's a big difference in the softness. The Turkish ones are a lot shinier, a little more stuck together. These ones are definitely a more dull texture to them. I just bit into one of the orange Turkish ones and yeah, it tastes like orange. It's not a bad taste. Let's try the German version. I can tell the German one is also orange, but it tastes different. Like it's maybe a bit more like a real orange. I the Turkish one definitely has a bit more of a vibrant orange taste than the German one. The texture is the biggest difference between the two though. The German one is much chewier, less soft and supple. In fact, the soft versions that came from Germany are much more similar to the US one. So if you're living in Germany and you're interested in how the texture is of the gold bears here or the ones at least sold here, they're very much like the soft version of the ones you can buy in Germany right now. The flavors are gonna be different of course because there's some extra banana and stuff like that that, that aren't in the, the Turkish ones here. But definitely from a texture perspective and a, and a look and feel and a shininess to, to, you know, versus the dull, it's all in the soft ones and the German ones. They're pretty much modeled after these, I think. All right, so I've tried a few more of the flavors and, of, you know, trying them side by side, kind of eating half and half. And I do have to say that I prefer the softer, kind of shinier texture of the U.S. sold ones, the ones from Turkey here but I prefer the flavors of the German one. They're just, I don't know, it's its hard to describe the difference. I mean, it's not dramatic, the difference, but there's just something slightly more pleasing about the flavors in the ones from Germany. So really my ideal one would be the softness of the ones here or the soft version in Germany with the flavor profile of the regular Gold Bears from the German variety. That would be ideal. Can someone make that for me, please? I have gone handheld. So you can tell the Turkish variety that are made for the US are on this side, there are only four flavors, they're shinier, and then the German made, maybe the ones destined for Europe, there are five flavors, and you can see them on the top row. The color difference isn't actually nearly as dramatic as I thought, it's really the green one that's so, so different. This red one's almost the same, and then we just lack this particular flavor in the US because the green one is actually that flavor. These two have the same flavor, and that light green German one, which is the apple one, is not here. So. Why on earth is this green one not Apple in the US? I got no idea. All right, so let's take a look at this Commodore stuff on the bench. Now the 64 that Yuli sent is a little beat up, but overall it's okay, it's dirty, it's not in the greatest condition. I think with a little cleaning, it probably would look okay. He mentioned in his letter that this thing doesn't work, well, at least when he tried it, and he has a 64 that does work, so he sent this over to me. Well, let's crack this open and see if we can see an obvious fault with this machine. I love it that this West German 64, just like the others I've gotten, uses small screws. While all the bread pins I open here in North America use large ones. Oh, that screw is missing altogether. So only two screws. Someone has clearly been inside this computer already. Here we go. What are we gonna find inside? Bugs, dirt, who knows? So nothing much to report there. It is missing the ferrite ring that all the US ones have. So pff. anyways, I take those off typically anyways. Oh, the good old paper RF shield. I just hate these things. In fact, um, this thing should slide off the cartridge slot here. There we go. Oh, hello. Someone has tried to open that up and they didn't either cut right there or desolder the little blob that's on there, pal. The good old 250 407 motherboard revision. Very common, very rude that everything is soldered on except for the SID, even the PLA is not in a socket. 
I'm going to take out all the screws so I can get this paper cardboard RF shield off of here. Sorry, but I definitely don't keep these on here. They're like a heat trapper more than anything. Okay, this should pop out. Yes, it does. Goodbye to you. This is pretty funny, this <laughs> bent up shield. I think I'm just gonna snip right here and get that off of there. One cut and that comes right off. So the motherboard says assembled in Hong Kong. So what's up with the West Germany sticker on the bottom of the computer? I guess the final assembly was West Germany. They probably sent completed motherboards in huge boxes or pallets to Germany where they put the rest of the computer together. But that's sort of misleading, isn't it? This 64 has the good old MT RAM. So I'm wagering that the fault is either gonna be the PLA that's bad or the MT RAM that's bad. It's gonna be one of these two things, these super unreliable later Moss PLAs. So this is the late 84 bread bin. I am also noticing right here on top of the choke, it's all scratched up. And that typically happens, at least from my experience, if you stack a bunch of boards on top of each other without anything protecting them. The later ones that had the RF shield kind of soldered onto this, or they used the US ones, when you stack those up, it doesn't scratch up the components because that's just a slick bottom. But ones like this that don't have anything except for that cardboard, which you add after, you end up getting these scratched up components, especially this part right here, it is the highest part, and the pins from the motherboards that are stacked on top do scratch this. So this has got evidence that this, has, this was stacked up at some point in its life. Looking on the bottom, I am not seeing any evidence of rework. There's a little bit of flux residue just here and there, but I don't think it was cleaned very well, this board, when it was manufactured in Hong Kong. But all the chips look pretty much original. The RAM chips all match each other. Yeah, there's not a lot to report. Oh, these capacitors right here are also scratched up, probably from boards stacking on top. Interesting. I wonder if that would have happened at the factory or if that happened just because this was a parts board, someone stuck it in that random case and gave it to Yuli. On this mail call, I'm gonna do some quick testing right now just to see if there's obvious faults with this thing, which I can write up here. But most likely, because everything is soldered, this thing is gonna require further, deeper repair. And I will do that on a repair-a-thon along with those other 64s I received on a previous mail call. Well, several mail calls ago, I got those smashed up 64s. I think at least one or two of those are faulty so I have at least two machines to do a repair-a-thon on. So as usual, the first quick check is gonna be checking the voltage rail. So five volts coming through the switch and everything, because the switch can be bad. We're gonna check 12 volts on the voltage regulator and five volts on this regulator. So here we go. 12 volts first, 11.9, that looks good. 5.01 on the, this regulator, that looks good. And just under five volts on the primary rail that's coming directly from my external power supply. That tells us very quickly that the connector and the switch and this fuse are all good. So let's connect up my video cable. Oh, I heard a pop from the speaker. And let's hit the power and see what we get here. Come on, what's going on, retro tank? This is a PAL unit, so... Oh, uh, kind of a dark purple screen. It's a bit strange. Let's power cycle it. It's a bit weird. That's not even a color that the 64 can produce. I'm not quite sure what we're looking at there. Let's try to get this can off here and I can take a look at the VIC. There it is. Let me turn this back on. I just give this thing a push. Make sure it's in there. No, I'm still getting that weird purpley color. Weird. Let me do a quick check for extremely hot ICs. So far so good. These are okay. SID is warm, but that's pretty normal. Now these MT RAM chips, any of these hot. These are so failure prone and they've, they often get hot when they're, when they're broken. No, unfortunately, none of these RAM chips are hot. Everything seems fine. Just for fun, let's test out dead test. With a purple screen like that, I'm not holding out hope that dead test is gonna do anything at all. It's probably just gonna give us the purple screen again. Oh, we got a black screen. That's interesting. Okay, well, let's let it sit here for a second. Now it's been running for a little while here and we got absolutely nothing on here, which is definitely an indicator that there is a fault that prevents dead test from even running. And I recycled the power and now we got this weird sort of purpley screen. Yeah, power cycling this machine, I'm getting all sorts of like weird things. Look at this particular pattern. 
Let's see if twisting the board has any effect. It does not. That's just a bit odd, so to speak. Could be a clock issue. There could be all sorts of issues. Oh, we're getting this more consistently now. Anyways, okay. I'm just gonna write a note on here. Dead test did nothing. And I'll put random stuff happens, no text and black screen. And we'll stick this on here. And this will be for a future repair-a-thon. Next up, we have some joysticks that were sent along. I like it. Two of these have suction cups, and the third one here does not. So this first joystick says Quick Joy right here. And I notice right here, there's a little switch, and one position doesn't have a label, but the other position, if I move it over to the left, says CPC 464. The connector on here is just a standard nine pin. So I assume moving the switch over to the right means Atari slash Commodore slash everything nine, you know, standard nine pin compatibility. There's what it says on the bottom, Quick Joy SV122, I think it says. When you move the Quick Joy, it's not clicky. There's no micro switches in the base here. The next joystick is this one, and this is quite a light joystick, much lighter than this one. It is micro switch based in the bottom here, and you move it and it does click. These are clicky as well. The bottom says QJ, maybe Quick Joy. QJI Turbo SV121. And finally, there is this gray joystick, which does have normal and quick different switch settings there. These are clicky, but I guess they are two different buttons, although you can tell it's one piece of plastic. When I push one, the other one moves, and the joystick is switch-based. Nice. Ergonomics are pretty terrible, though. I mean, maybe you're just mean, meant to hold this down on the desk like this, play like that. I'm, I'm not too sure. Nothing is written on the bottom at all, so who knows who actually makes this one. If you recognize this gray one, let me know in the comment section. Here's this Mastertronic game, Sue Townsend and the Growing Pains of Adrian Mole, programmed by Level 9. I can't say I'm familiar with this game at all, but we're going to have to try it out because, of course, it's got my name in it. Growing Pains of Adrian Mole, Ricochet. Is that Ricochet? Is that the name of the game? Playing this game will take you through 18 months of the life of Adrian Mole, and when you have loaded the first part of the game, following instructions below, you'll see that as you progress through the day in Adrian's diary, you will be asked to make choices for Adrian. Whether you have read Sue Townsend's best-selling books or not, you should have no trouble guiding Adrian through the trials and tribulations of school and family life. So I definitely have not. So let me break out a 64. We can test out these joysticks, and then we can try this game. All right, so in Adrian's tool, I do have a little joystick tester, joystick check. I think this is the simple one. Oh yes, okay, here we are. So this joystick is connected. It's connected to port one, obviously. So up, down, left, right, switches are working well. Ooh, diagonal though, not so great. Both up and left are clicked, and yet look how those are flickering. Turbo is turned on, and when I push it, there is blinking going on there. And when I push this button, nothing happens. Switch to normal, nothing again. Now it's possible this is wired up for some kind of like second joystick button on a different pin or something, I don't know. But definitely flaky, flaky, flaky. It's possible that a good cleaning will help this joystick out. Okay, this is the other joystick I have plugged in right now on port two. This one does appear to be working fine. Both trigger buttons. I'm seeing no flashing or no flakiness. Definitely diagonal is working, although it's a little squeaky and ergonomics aren't great. Yeah, you really need to put this on the desk with the suction cups. And finally, the granddaddy Quick Joy SV122. Hmm, hmm, that doesn't look good. It's, uh, we have one stuck one. How about the triggers? That trigger works. That trigger works. If we turn on this button, this button here is sort of like a permanent turbo. I guess for games where you don't want to be constantly having to even hold the button, you just push the switch. That definitely is solid. That is solid. And now that's just permanent turbo, interesting. But the fact this is not micro switch based, that's not great, that it's definitely stuck. It's possible to be fixed as well. The growing pains of Adrian Mole. Let's give this a try. And now we wait for it to load. There we go. 
Welcome to part three of The Growing Pains of Adrian Mole from level nine and Virgin Games. Wait, so part three, if it's still running, no, okay, I'll stop the tape. This program would normally be loaded after you have finished playing through the part of Adrian's life lead up to this part. So are there more tapes? I didn't see part three on here. Wednesday, September 1st. My father has gone to see Brett and Stick Insect. My mother made him go, so once I am living in a broken... So once again, I am living in a broken home. Friday, September 3rd, full moon. Pandora is taking canoeing lessons in preparation for her River Y holiday. So this really feels like it's a choose your own adventure. And I guess this doesn't even say part three on here. So that's what's really quite confusing to me that this sort of starts off right in the middle and there must be more tapes, I guess. I don't know. Does anyone know if... I don't really get that this seems to have started off like in the middle of the game and there's more to it, but this tape doesn't say part three or anything about parts whatsoever. So if you've played this game and you're familiar, please let me know in the comment section below. I do love that the main character in this game appears to share the same first name as me. I don't know the gender of the character in this, but um, yeah, this is pretty cool. If you have any, oops, if you have fond memories of playing this game as a youth, I'd love to hear all about it. So there we have it. Thanks, Yuli, for this awesome PAL 64, which you will see in a future C64 repair-a-thon. And then thanks for those joysticks. And of course, thank you for the wonderful German Haribo Gold Bears. I just love those candies. All right, we have a package. It has no name on it, but it comes from Dunkirk, New York. So not the UK, here in the US. Hi to all my viewers in New York State. This package arrived at my P.O. box on the 26th of August. All right, we have a little small white box, a note, and a bag of Haribo Gold Bears. And we have the U.S. version. These ones are manufactured in Turkey, as it always seems like they are in the U.S. And look, I have some of the German Haribos right here that I've been munching on while opening up packages. The note says, Adrian, I just want to say how much I enjoy your YouTube channel. Thanks for sharing the educational content and putting new life into retro equipment. Here's something to play with, a Super Zaxxon clone cartridge. It was advertised as a Commodore 64 Zaxxon reproduction designed to behave identically to the original for testing C64 PLA chips. Enjoy, John. Thank you very much, John. You know, it's funny. Um, I think this comes from Jay in London, Ontario whom I have been chatting with. He makes a whole line of really awesome Commodore 64 things. And I'm pretty sure, yep, that can tell by the way he's packaged, this is packaged up, that this comes from Jay. Let's see, this looks like one that's all built up. And there it is, there's a little reproduction cartridge. I'm gonna need to find a case for this, or maybe I can 3D print something. But a reproduction Zaxxon cartridge and a very nice PCB at that has gold contacts and stuff like that. So anyway, let's take a look at this on the bench. A Super Zaxxon clone. What an awesome thing that John sent me. Of course, the Harry Bows are delicious as well. <laughs> I'll never say anything bad about those. But yes, this is a replica of Super Zaxxon such that it will expose any flaws in the PLA on a Commodore 64 due to the way this thing does bank switching. At least that's my understanding. I'm gonna pop this in to the ZIF64, which is currently sporting a PLA Advanced. Now on my Easy Flash, I have a copy of Super Zaxxon, but from my understanding, when I run it off this, it definitely will not have problems on problematic PLAs. But the original cartridge design is such that it definitely shows issues on some PLAs. If you take a look at my GAL PLA video, I'll put a link in the description below, I did do a test with Super Zaxxon cartridge with the 15 nanosecond version of those gals, and it did have an issue. The game is playing the demo here. Let me pick one for one player. And here we go. Oh, and I immediately died. It's when you first start the level, there will be graphical corruption if your PLA is problematic. I'm not surprised in the slightest that the PLA Advanced handles this without any issue whatsoever. It's also weird, I'm, I'm not playing the demo, but the ship flies down on its own. I'm not even touching the joystick right before it enters that, that entrance there. It's almost like it's trying to help you. Like if I fly over here, 
it should probably fly down on its own. Look at that. Tunnel in. Very interesting. I was a big fan of this game on my Apple II, but compared to this version, I mean, I know this is Super Zaxxon, so I think this is like a later version of the game versus the earlier one. This looks incredible. Like the graphics are smooth and clear and Oh, that's weird how I just sort of flew right off the end, though. I guess I was supposed to have done something and I didn't. Player one, game over. Let me swap out the PLA Advance for a couple other ones and see if this game works properly. Unfortunately, my Gal PLA, I think I stuck it in one of my other 64s. I don't really know where it is right now. Uh, I seem to have a Plankton and I have um, Platinum here. So I have two different ones to try. So I just took out the PLA Advanced. I made a video on this thing. It's pretty amazing. This thing can basically act as the PLA for quite a number of different machines that use the original 82S100, with the 64 just being one of them. I'm gonna put this one in, which is the Platinum. Uh, this one may not even boot the computer at all. And that's because I think this one requires me to make some modifications to the motherboard or something. So if this just gives a pure black screen, it's not to do with Super Zaxxon. It's, I haven't made those modifications to make this thing work. Let's see what happens. Yeah, the Platinum doesn't even work at all in a machine without adding a resistor or I don't know, you have to do something to it to make it work. It won't even boot your computer, which is one of the reasons why I don't really recommend this one, especially when you have alternatives available to you that don't require any modification on any of the 64s. And this PLA replacement is the Plankton. And the thing about the Plankton is this, it is known to be perfectly compatible with everything. Okay, let's see what happens with Super Zaxxon. I mean, this is definitely known to work perfectly. So we're gonna hit joystick and one player. And when I hit one, this is where the graphical corruption would happen right here. And it's not happening, it's working fine. So this of course works and that was completely expected that it would work perfectly. So thank you very much, John, for the Haribo Gold Bears and the Super Zaxxon replica cartridge. I will put a link in the description for where you can buy this yourself if you're looking to do PLA testing. Also, if anyone can recommend a good STL file so I can print a nice case for this, I would love to know that if you can put a comment in the comment section. Well, that's gonna be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this little Commodore extravaganza of mail call items. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't know what to do, you can press that thumbs down button Please put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And of course, subscribe to my channel to get notified. Well, of course, subscribe and hit the bell icon if you wanna be notified when I upload new videos. And that's if, of course, YouTube feels like doing that because it's kind of hit and miss. Anyways, that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.